So we're going to get going. And Mary is going to do the announcements for us. Hello, welcome all. Welcome, welcome, welcome to St. Anthony Park Lutheran Church. We're glad you're here. I'm Mary Mergenthal. And if you'd been here Sunday, then you would have known my name is really Mary Morris Mergenthal. But there might be another Welsh thing coming up in some time, and then you can come to that. But here we are to talk about the history of St. Anthony Park. Now we're talking about the 40s and 50s, and you won't be sure you came. So glad, as we have for the last many months, have Kristen Anderson from Augsburg University with us to take us on our, our sit-down tour of the area. Um, you, the, the facts of life around here are the handicapped, uh, accessible, and unisex bathroom is right out there next to the Como entrance. And uh, after the program, when we turn the lights up, take some time to walk around and look at these new paintings. They're done by a member of our church. They start over there. It's the Stations of the Cross. And it, it, our theme for our Lenten time is Coyote, Cross, and Christ. Now, you may never, never have heard of a Lenten series that starts with Coyote. So check out these pictures, and you'll see, if you look closely, sometimes it's very obvious, not always. There's a coyote in every one of them, because the man who painted them, uh, excuse me, Fred Thompson, worked with the Navajo for a while. And the coyote is a, is a symbol of a trick, he's a trickster, and he ties that in with the station. So they're lovely, and when we turn the lights on, take time to take, take a time to look. There's an explanation outside that door, printed explanation. And I'll quit talking. Please welcome Kristen. Thanks, Mary. And thanks, everyone, for coming tonight or coming in online. Andy and I were talking about how we blame the weather or talk about the weather for everything. It's really cold, so people won't come. It's really icy, so people, it's raining. It's too nice, so people won't come. But, you know, thank goodness for being online and being able to watch for a week or so afterwards. We are looking at housing in the 1940s and 50s this month, and uh, you know the plan, because I use the same format for the beginning of every presentation. We have books, or Adam has books, or Adam has access to books. There is Adam's email address, and Adam's sitting over there, so um, they're waving his hand. So um, get your phone out, take a picture of anything that looks helpful and interesting, including this with Adam's email address. Uh, at my website, kristenanderson.org slash sapmaps, you can get a look at um, the plat maps for the area. And if I remember, and the, you know, that's a big if, um, there's a map that I'm going to show you tonight about um, an assessment of housing conditions in the Twin Cities. Well, actually, it, it's accessed a number of cities across the country, but St. Paul and Minneapolis are listed. I'll show you some details of it, but um, I'll try to remember. And if I don't get it posted in the next couple of days, somebody can just send me a reminder and say, hey, you were going to post that for us. Uh, also, uh, a website I do not control, although I do use it a lot. It's the interactive Ramsey County property map. And uh, you can get all kinds of fun information here. Most particularly, here's Speedy Market again. Uh, information about when something was built, as well as sometimes if you follow the link to tax and property info, which is right there, you can sometimes get a photograph of the building. Not always, but once in a while that's there. So these are handy tools if you want to kind of look around and mess around and have a look at things. Um, speaking of goofing around, next time, April 9th, we'll be looking at housing from the 1960s and beyond. I'd originally planned 1940s, 50s, and 60s for tonight. And then I remembered that half of the University Grove was done after 1960. And so it made sense to put the 40s and 50s together and then to group all the rest. It seems like a long time. But uh, as you can see with our numbers, as time goes on, there's less and less available space in the neighborhood. So it isn't as though there are endless farm fields that could be bought up, as happened in the first and second and third ring suburbs, so the housing could just continue to grow. Limited amount of space meant that there wasn't quite as much building going on. So um, I've taken us back here to the 1900s number, um, just to give you a little bit of perspective about uh, how much was being built 
in each of the decades, including adding the 1940s and 50s there in the lower right-hand corner. So you can mess around with these numbers a little bit. Uh, notice that the 1940s are our low point so far. And then things bounce back in the 1950s. So together here, we're at about 200 housing starts. If you combine the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, that is from 1930 through 1959, you can see that what was built in the neighborhood in the 19-teens was a bigger number than this 30-year span. So um, again, it has a lot to do with available space. And we'll see a little bit about which kinds of spaces were chosen and used at various points, um, especially now that we start to run out of space in the 1940s and following. Not only are the numbers in the 1940s relatively low, they're coming off the Depression. Half of the decade is World War II. There's some issues about availability of materials and workers that kept housing starts low. But we can dig in for the specific numbers and learn, for instance, that there was one house built in 1942 in the neighborhood. That's a duplex that's, that's uh, out on Como, up towards the northwest from here. And one house built in 1945, that's on Brewster. So not a lot of activity. I've been told but have not personally verified that in Minneapolis there were three residential building permits pulled in 1943. So really, not a whole lot going on. Oh, shoot, I forgot to put in the pictures for this. <laughs> oh, wait, that's because there were no houses built in 1943 <laughs> or 1944. Gotcha on that one, didn't I? Yes, I did, and I knew it would work. OK, uh, as I often do, a little look at uh, other buildings in the neighborhood, some broader context to what was going on. The Gutterson School was not built in the 1940s or the 1950s, although it was torn down in the 1950s. Here's its original appearance, 1887-1888, built uh, in what's now the Methodist Church parking lot at Como Commonwealth Hillside, that intersection right at the infamous curve, as a matter of fact. And there's the curve right there with the streetcar tracks included. It was built because uh, already in the late 1880s, there was a sense that the northern section of the neighborhood would be developing. There was already a school, the Baker School, in the southern section of the neighborhood. That had been a district school before that area even belonged to the city of St. Paul. So it started out as a township school, essentially, and then was transformed into a city school. This one was built as a city school. And within 20 years, they doubled the size of the building, took off the tower, have a look at the old one. Added on to the building, as you can see. Uh, this project, 1907-1908, supposedly done by Clarence Johnston's firm, but the building permit actually says Cass Gilbert's company did this. So I like to imagine Cass Gilbert at his new office in New York City, setting aside his plans for the Woolworth building, the tallest building in the world, <laughs> so that he could mess around with the addition to the Gutterson School. Actually, no, this would have been before he was working on the Woolworth Project. And his St. Paul office was still open, and he had people here who were working for him and managing and handling these local projects. Well, the school in this version got to be overcrowded, and then in this version, also overcrowded. Uh, a number of the elementary school kids who lived north of Como got transferred up to what's now Murray, in the 1920s when that opened. So it was supposed to be a junior high, but they added some of the primary grades. Again, space got to be a big issue. And that continued to be a problem. They added portable classrooms, uh, which, as I understand, did not have plumbing in them. So kids had to go back and forth to the main building to use the bathroom. And then they, they realized, uh, especially with the baby boomers, boomers arriving on the scene, that they probably needed a new school. It was partly a matter of space, as this little drawing on the left indicates, um, kids falling out the windows because there was no space, and the building kind of bulging out at the sides. Um, certainly, it had a lot to do with different understandings about education and how classrooms should be set up and arranged. And so you can see over on the right a clipping from the newspaper, a new school model. Um, here, fake trees being put in around the model by an architect named Richard Hamill, who at the time worked for Toltz King and Day. Um, he went on to found a firm, co-found a firm, 
Hamill, Green, and Abramson, HGA. And he also um, built a house for himself in the neighborhood, which is here. This is the Richard Hamill house, which I'll talk about next time. Do you want to laugh about that again? <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's good. I spent so much time on that joke, so it's good to get the feedback. All right, here it is. Some of you may remember this school uh, when it looked like this before all of its many additions, off to the back, off to the ends, the various portable classrooms that were put in uh, at various times. The school opened in 1954, dedicated in 1955, and as I understand, Gutterson students can uh, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I've heard stories that students were um, required, requested to carry things from the old school to the new school. If not their own books, then, you know, library books and things like that. So it became a kind of community effort. It sat where it sits now, but on a site where there had been a number of old houses that faced Langford Park. Uh, some of the old houses were moved, but the oldest of them were uh, torn down, the ones that faced the park. And for a number of years, um, the street went through, and there was traffic on the street. And then that was eventually closed, I think, you know, after the usual. There was an incident. And so it's like, okay, we need to close the streets because some kid um, was hurt there. So um, how many of you are St. Anthony Park Elementary alums or parents of St. Anthony Park Elementary students? Yeah, a lot of SAP elementary connections here in the room. And perhaps some connections to this uh, educational facility. This is the doorway to the uh, St. Anthony Park nursery school that's at the Methodist Church. And the reason that I've included this is that the Methodist Church put an addition on their building in 1958 that was made specifically to house a nursery school because the pastor's wife was a kindergarten and nursery school teacher and they wanted more classrooms and that sort of thing, but they got specifically a nursery school facility because uh, Mrs. Burgess was a nursery school teacher. So that nursery school has been operating since 1958. Some changes in another educational institution, kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum from the nursery school. My mom used to run the, the other nursery school, the one that's at the UCC church, and my dad taught at Luther Seminary, so they often joked that they had the same families in their classrooms, that my mom had the three-year-olds and my dad had the, the parents um, at two different schools. But here's an early view of the Luther Seminary campus. At the point that Bachman Hall was its main and only building, and then a couple of faculty houses shown over there on the right, uh, that worked for a while, of course, but uh, there were some mergers, and so the institution became larger just because students, for instance, who had gone to school at the seminary over by Hamlin came over here starting in 1917. And then, especially after the Second World War, there was an influx of students, and so they decided that they needed more space and they built Gullickson Hall. There's its cornerstone from 1948. This building was built as the library, but also to house uh, some classrooms, a number of offices, and then Bachman Hall was converted largely to dormitory space. They left the chapel, there's the old chapel, at least for a time, it's gone now, and they left uh, the rec room so those were the only things that weren't dormitory space. Now it has offices and classrooms and that sort of thing in it. The chapel leads us to another of the 1940s, 50s um, community buildings, and that is this one. The congregation that worships here started in that chapel in 1902, and they stayed there until the late 1940s when they built this building. So here's an aerial view of the building as it exists now without the solar panels, which we're counting on for things like the microphone and the projector and all the rest. But the original part of the building was just here from the doorway straight back. This space where you'll have your treats if you're here with us today, uh, that's an addition that was designed by Dick Shane, a congregation member. We'll see his house um, in a little while. Uh, then they added uh, education space and then they added onto the education wing. So uh, as the congregation expanded, in the 1940s and into the 1950s, there were, this, this room was built first and then there were additions that were placed on it. Here's what it looked like inside uh, back when it was new. So from the Como entrance looking up towards this direction. 
I read something just today about how they raised money for the pews at a state fair food booth that they had. So I'm not sure if they used folding chairs or quite what they did, but in 1949 and 1950, they were busy you know, serving coffee and food and all the rest at a booth at the state fair. I think that the members of the Methodist Church uh, raised money for the building that's over at Como and Knapp and Hillside through their food booth um, in the early part of the 20th century. So that's been fairly lucrative for a number of congregations. I also read a funny story, and now I can't remember the guy's name, about a guy who volunteered to wash dishes, and he, um, they, people waited and waited for him to show up, and he didn't show up, and his wife came by and said, where's Art? We don't, you know, I haven't seen him. Nobody knew where he was. And then uh, later in the evening, he evidently came by, and he was evidently, I think the terms were, terribly embarrassed. He'd been busy washing and drying dishes for Como Park Lutherans, <laughs> State Fair booth. And he said he thought it was kind of strange. He didn't know any of the people. But they were really nice, and they were happy for his help. And so he, he stayed there and, and uh, washed dishes for them. So they were busy raising money for something, too. But these pews were paid for by all the folks who go to the state fair and, and wanted a cup of coffee or a pancake or whatever it was. Another uh, church from this era, Corpus Christi, over on Cleveland at Buford, built in 1940. So there's the front door as it faces the campus and faces Cleveland, and here's a view of the front door. I think that this picture was taken when one of the priests was celebrating an ordination anniversary. And um, this, this parish uh, started relatively late in the scheme of things in the neighborhood and worshiped first in the basement of the Milton Square buildings at, while this building was being uh, fundraised for and built and didn't have any room for a parochial school next to the church, so that got situated out at Roseville. Who's been to the farmer's market in Roseville? You've been to the parochial school's parking lot. And then uh, the building was sold eventually to the Emily program, and uh, a new building for the parish has been built out in Roseville on County Road B. But that was a 1940s building. This was not. This is a 1980s building. Its first use was as the St. Anthony Park Bank which has been through a surprising number of buildings for its, uh, its history. I think it, the first building was 1917. And um, two buildings on the current site, and this one, and one building with a big remodel on the original site. Well, on that block, uh, here comes Carter in at the right. Gove is over here at the left. Gove, by the way, that's the correct pronunciation. Gove. Don't tell me otherwise, and Donna Teeter can tell you for sure. So uh, the first building on that site was this building, although its first use was as the Bethel Academy. So Bethel College, Bethel University Seminary started out here in the neighborhood as a high school program. Then they built over on Snelling, across from the state fairgrounds, in what's now the Job Corps buildings that face the fairgrounds. And then they moved to Arden Hills. But they started out here in about 1906, used the building for about a decade before they outgrew it and moved to their new campus on Snelling. And then it became an insurance company building, uh, starting in about 1917. So here's, here's um, once it became the St. Paul Mutual Insurance Company. Before that, it had been the Midland Insurance Company. And I think the Gove family was involved in one of those companies. In 1957, the insurance company put this addition on the front, the Como side of the building. Uh, Liebenberg and Kaplan, for those of you who know Twin Cities architecture, uh, those, that firm uh, designed this, this building. And then uh, you can see now the sign says H.B. Fuller Company General Laboratory. In 1964, H.B. Fuller bought the building from the insurance company. Here it is from the side, which clarifies a little bit the older part of the building and the newer part of the building. So we're looking from um, Park Service across Gove to the parking lot along the side. And we're looking towards the library. We just can't see the library because this building's in the way. Here it is again with a nice little gas station view in the foreground. And then you can see the older part of the building at the back, the newer part up at the front. The bank bought the property and they moved out of this building. This is their 19 teens bank, which in our decade, here's why it's included here, they remodeled into a, 
a mid-mod thing with a little drive-through on the side. So this sat next to Milton Square. And if you look along the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the Milton Square building. So you could uh, dress up in your, your mod men costume and go in and cosplay. You know, you could do a little banking there in the 1950s. So this is what the bank looked like once it was remodeled. Here is Park Service's current building, or part of it at least, under construction. This is 1957. So we're looking here at the restroom end, the office end, the coffee end, the candy end, the pay your bill end. And then the bays, the service bays, follow out um, away from us. The car wash was added later. So that's what we're looking at here. And what is that thing on the left? That's the old Park Service, the Park Cooperative Oil Association building. It faced Como, but the service bay was around the corner. So we're looking at the side of the building, and they, were, they didn't tear down their old one until the new one was finished. And here it is, once it was all finished, without the car wash at the end, but still quite recognizable for us today, as we have a look at it. 1957. Here, a newspaper photograph from 1959 of what's called the Too Good Building. Uh, this was the adoption center for the Children's Home Society. The Children's Home Society started in the building that's now the St. Anthony Park home. It was an orphanage. And so they, they housed children. Uh, and then it got to the point that there was more foster care instead of housing in an orphanage. And then this new building, a reflection of the new way that they were doing business. And it's uh, called the Too Good Building. I think it's still called the Too Good Building. And I think from the property records, I think that the Emily program must lease it uh, rather than own it. There were additions put on it. Uh, so you can see if you look at the, the older picture, there's an addition that goes off towards Milton Square and then up around on Commonwealth as well. But here's what it looks like today. I've always been amused about the name Too Good. Um, Mr. Toogood worked for the Children's Home Society, and he's one of those folks who had or has a name that matches his profession. You know, social services, and his last name is Toogood. Very entertaining for me. My favorite was reading about uh, an expert on lightning, and lightning strikes. His name was George Fryer. <laughs> Seriously, he was at the U. So play with that one. Uh, group health. How many of you were group health patients back in the day? Few of us. Um, the permit was pulled in 1955. The building opened in 1957. And this is a much expanded version. They added on to the building um, lengthwise along Como. They added an upper story to the building as well. And now they're going to build across the street on the, the uh, old seminary field. So another of the, the buildings from our era. But enough about housing institutions. Let's look at some houses. That's why you're here, right? That's why I'm here. OK, so um, a bit about what's going on with housing in the neighborhood uh, at this point. As I mentioned, there, there wasn't a lot of open space available. And that makes a difference about what gets built and where it's built and some of the patterns that we see with how things are uh, added to the neighborhood. So for instance, one of the things that we see is um, kind of looking for empty lots, looking for open spaces. And um, there were a couple of different um, approaches, I guess, that you could take related to what we call infill. So one of the possibilities for infill was that there might just be an open lot somewhere. And sometimes those open lots were associated with, um, I guess, not um, surprising kinds of areas or spaces. Uh, that is, you'd get a big house, like the old Cheney house from the 1880s, at the corner of Langford Park West and Gordon. And it would be built on a great big lot. So there was, and still is, space around it on both sides. But in 1956, around the corner, actually, you can sort of see, kind of tucked in right there, is a little house that's also red, by the way. That's 65 Langford. So here's the original house. And then here's the house that's built just kind of on the, the side yard. So um, a, a kind of a typical thing to do. Many of the, the old houses in the neighborhood, the oldest houses, were pretty large. 
Uh, and so they often had space around them. Here's uh, an example of another of these houses. Uh, this is a group, I think, on Priscilla. Nope, sorry, this is on Brewster. And there's a great big 1880s house right here. There are a few of these kind of dotted along the street. And then there would have been not just a big house, but often open space around it. And so we get, um, <coughs> here's the big old house from the 80s. And, and then here we get this kind of mid-century small scale house. This is, the, uh, this is 2282 right next to it. Um, a very typical example of what's called minimal traditional. And you'll learn those styles a little bit later. So hang on, because it's going to get exciting. <laughs> on the left, a great big house on Hillside, corner of Hillside and Gordon. So if you start at Langford Park, there are two great big houses. Um, one is in the Gordon Triangle. The Cheney House is just across the way facing it. And then you move up, and there's an 1890s house, an 1891 house, kind of a big one in one on Ludlow that got a 1950s house built next to it. Then you get to Hillside and Gordon. There's a big house now, one in from the corner. And then uh, you get up to Commonwealth, and there's another huge house built one in from the corner. Those were big houses with big space around them. And in our time period, they, they get uh, things built next to them. So a uh, 1960s house over on the right of this one, and over on the left is a 1940s house. Uh, the picture on the right is um, mm, my inspiration, I have to say. So this is a drone photograph. My next thing is to buy a drone so I can take pictures of St. Anthony Park, and then we can all learn even more by looking at the drone photographs. And I can spy on all of you. <laughs> See what you have in your backyards. I'll, oh, it'll be so much fun. And then I'll take pictures of it, and then I'll show everybody what you have in your backyard. <laughs> so that'll be way cool. So the house that we were just looking at is right there. And 1946, Paul, is that right for your house? 49. 40, 49? Okay. And then I think this one is 68 over here. And then you get up here to Commonwealth, and just off the slide to the right, there's another, another huge house. Here's another view of the drone picture. So there's the... There's the giant house, and it would have had a lot of space around it. Um, so kind of typical for what had happened originally. So big house, and then a block away, another big house, and another. And then it all gets filled in. Uh, here's the big house that's one in from Gordon on Commonwealth, built in the 1880s. It was illustrated in one of the, the publications about nice houses in St. Paul back in the day. Uh, here's another view of it. And then we get a 1930s house on the left, the one with the shingles, and a 1940s house on the other side of it. So that's another, a specific kind of infill that we see going on uh, in a number of these places. We also get some areas that weren't fully developed yet, where there was a chance to put in a few houses in a row. So here along Branston, the east side of Branston, uh, up close to Hoyt, I think that's... Norman and Catherine Mullen's old house right there, on, facing Hoyt, on the north side of Hoyt. So a set of houses along here, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. So uh, these two, for instance, uh, fall into our time period, both, I think, 1940s houses in the colonial revival style. So to get a lot here and there, that kind of infill was one of the possibilities. And then to get a few lots, to get an area, uh, where that was possible. One of those areas is here, um, near our drone shot. The area at the lower right-hand corner of the slide was a, um, a wetland, and um, not the place that they were doing a lot of building, obviously, until the 1950s. It starts to get filled in, and I've actually heard a story about this house, which we'll see in just a few minutes. We'll see it a couple of times tonight. Uh, the, there's a tuck under garage, and it wasn't supposed to be a tuck under garage. It was supposed to be at street level. And then they ended up filling more than they expected in that spot. So the house got, well, the garage is now a lower story, essentially. But a lot of the houses that are here, this is Hillside out there. Here's Gordon coming along this way. This is Commonwealth. A lot of these houses are relatively recent just because it wasn't buildable land until the city came in and started to do some filling there. One of the houses in this area is this bright yellow one. Handy for us, makes it easy to see. A 1946 house, famous because it was the home of? 
Bud Grant. Yeah, Bud Grant lived here. His wife, Patricia Nelson, I think was her name, um, grew up on what was then called Pierce, but is now Valentine. So she had family in the neighborhood, and uh, that was the Bud Grant house. Kids at, at Gutterson School, maybe with some of you, maybe not. Okay, here's the house I mentioned before that has the sort of tuck under garage that was supposed to be street level. And they'd already done some filling, and then they ended up filling even more uh, in order to get um, something other than wetland uh, for houses to be built. This uh, is a house that Dick Shane built. He was an architect. Um, he's, he was a member of this congregation, and he's the one who designed the Narthex space where you came in, if you came in from Como, and you will enjoy your treats afterwards. One of the other areas, generally speaking, where there was some buildable land still in the 1940s and 1950s was in the spots that were farthest away from the bus lines, farthest away from the grocery stores and the pharmacies, and um, a little bit challenging in terms of their location. So here we'll look at four houses that are at the west end of Bourne. And they're not at the very west end, it's not as though the the most recent houses are way at the end, and then they built in order. They didn't build in order. But these are pretty much down the hill. And uh, so this one is from 1955. If you know Bourne, you know there's a big hill that you need to climb up. So it's not just steps on your pedometer or your phone. It's, um, it's a kind of a strenuous activity if you need to hike up to Speedy because you forgot to buy one of the ingredients for dinner. Uh, this one's from 1949, and in this case, we have not only the, the hill on Bourne, but notice that this house is quite literally on two levels, and, and it's a two-story house behind the garage. So you've got three levels inside the house, uh, in other words, a sort of a, an altitude-challenged interior as well as being, and lot, as well as being on this, um, this very, very steep hill. 1957, a more traditional house in terms of style. I think it's the only split level, or I maybe have one other split level that's included. But this is um, an example of what's called a tri-level split. So sometimes split level houses have an entry um, kind of at ground level and you go down for half of the house and you go up for the other half of the house. Uh, in this case, um, you enter at the lowest level and then there's a level off to the side and another level. Frequently it's bedrooms above the garage. Uh, but this is an example of a 1957 house, and this one, a duplex from 1948. So these are all at the west end of Bourne, in an area where there's, again, a hillside and perhaps a little bit of, of challenge. Other geographically uh, challenged spaces were kind of held out from building and then scooped up and used at this time. Uh, this is a pair of 1956 duplexes. They're on Como up that way, and I own this building, and I lived on this side of this building for about 15 years. My parents owned that one, and I lived on that side of the building when I was in grad school. So I know these buildings really well. Uh, and I can tell you, you can't see it so much from this area, but maybe this picture will help. Lots of stairs up from Como, and then an area that was cut flat for these two duplexes, and then more stairs to go up to an alley and then the alley has a hill going this way to get up to Fulham, the dead end of Fulham. So I learned fairly quickly that if I was um, unloading groceries or something, I should park in the back and come down the stairs. And if I was in the house and taking something out of the house, I should park in front and take things down the stairs. So gravity becomes your friend. And then inside, the houses are three stories. So again, a, an interesting kind of challenge. This property was purchased, and this house was built in another kind of reflection about how properties were chosen and why houses were built in our period. Uh, this was missionary furlough housing. And I'll show you a couple of others uh, from this group. There were quite a few buildings. Some of the houses were pre-existing houses from the 19-teens or the 1920s, but a number of them were built for missionary housing. Uh, this was built by the Evangelical Lutheran Church, not the group that is the, the organization to which this congregation belongs, but sort of two church bodies that go uh, in terms of mergers. And they, they had um, 
lots of missionaries in a number of different places, and they would be out for a number of years and then come back, and they'd stay for, I think, one or two years. The, the length of time they'd be on furlough changed um, as the years went on, but this meant that they didn't have to stay at their posts in Japan, for instance, where the Sorensons were, as long as they were going to be missionaries. They could come home, and the kids could go to school here, and they could acclimate to American life, and then they could go back, and it would uh, give them a chance to kind of refresh and, and then go back and not just say, well, I'm going to do my stint, and then I have to quit because I can't stay forever. Coming back, though, meant that you had to have some housing, and it's kind of difficult if you're in Japan to buy a house somewhere, um, like on the other side of the planet, and so it was really helpful to have the furlough housing. And then lots and lots of people went through these buildings. So it's kind of interesting to see the lists of all the people who lived here. Same plan, same builders, 1951, for this furlough house on Fulham. So we'll go back. Uh, no shutters on the one on Fulham, at least not anymore, but have a look at the big picture window arrangement on the first floor. These are a little bit different because they have separate entrances. This has one entrance, then you would go into one side or the other, but the windows are the same. The placement of the windows are the same. The floor plan is the same. So they, they got a lot on Fulham, and they, they hired the NASIF company to um, sort of plunk in one of these things that they uh, used the plan for again later on. Here's one on Keston. Same builders. In this case, they modified their plan a little bit, perhaps because of the available space, and they have um, an up-down duplex here. But look at those picture windows at the front. It's the same window that was used in, in the others. Just off to the left is the home of one of St. Anthony Park's famous architects, Charles Aldrich. And uh, over on the right, I think with a little bit more of it here, yep, there it is, a 19-teens house that was purchased by the church body to be used as missionary furlough housing. So some of these were meant for families, some of these were meant for uh, deaconesses, for single women who would live together in groups. So they had a variety of housing options just based on, on um, who was supposed to be housed in them. And these were not in a single location, but scattered all around the neighborhood. Again, where they could find a lot to build a house or build a duplex that they could use for this purpose. Not as many uh, apartment buildings built in the 1940s and 50s as we might expect, given the huge housing crunch that I'll tell you about in just a second. Uh, lots and lots of them are coming up in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s in particular. But uh, the housing crunch was often solved in a, an informal way with people renting basement spaces or a room in somebody's house or an attic or that sort of thing. But here's an example at Priscilla and Raymond of an apartment building from this era. And then, I think a really fascinating story here. 1947 is the date that you'll find if you look at the information online for Ramsey County about when these buildings were built. They're at Priscilla and Gibbs. And they're these kind of cool townhouses, row houses, that are a little bit unusual. Actually, they were built in 1947 on Rondo. 989 Rondo to 995 Rondo, six of them. And in 1960, when the freeway was coming through, there were a lot of houses that were torn down. My sister-in-law's family home was torn down. They were on Rondo, closer to the capital. Uh, and that, it was an older house, and, and their house was torn down. But these were new enough, they were only 13 years old, that they were sold to be moved. And so in 1960, they were moved to St. Anthony Park. And the, the permit for the move actually lists the route that they took to get here, which is kind of interesting. It's not as easy as you think, of course. You can't go under any underpasses and probably not over any bridges either. And so that was kind of complicated. And then the permit also says, the day that the move would take place, starting at 4 a.m. So they're, you know, they're taking utility lines down and they're moving when there's not a lot of traffic. But these six buildings uh, came up to this area from Rondo, where they were, again, relatively new buildings. Last time we finished with the house that's on the right, a modern style house, or modernistic, it's sometimes called, next to a colonial revival house. This is at the south edge of the grove on Vincent. Over along the right-hand side of the slide is Hoyt. We're going to look now at um, some of the, the studies, some of the reasons that houses were built 
uh, getting next to the styles of houses that we come across. And um, some of the building was not just a, um, oh, Thomas Hughesby buys a lot and builds a house kind of stuff, or Oscar builds a lot and buys a house. But instead, um, there are, things get complicated in the Great Depression and then certainly into World War II about what can be built and where it can be built. And the government gets involved because they realized that there was a huge housing crisis during the Great Depression. They knew that um, families were um, doubled and tripled up in housing, often multiple gener generations of the same family. They were in aging housing stock. So kind of a, you know, a double problem. You had too many people crammed into a space, and the space itself was old, maybe didn't have up-to-date plumbing. So it was a big challenge. And the government steps in, and they, they come up with a series of suggestions, I guess you could say, for what houses are supposed to be like. And then uh, the banks step in, in terms of financing, and they start to, well, and the government does this too, they're evaluating areas of the city. What's in good shape? What's not in good shape? Where are we willing to invest or not? Um, so there's, there are studies like this. This is from the late 1930s, early 1940s. It's a section of St. Paul that includes us. And uh, you can see here that the map is color-coded. And then there are explanations as well. Let's see if I can find my explanations here. Green, just a little bit of it here and there. That's the best, A. B, still desirable. C, definitely declining. They should have made that D, I think. C, definitely declining. D, hazardous. And then the cross-hatching is business and industrial. Notice that the entire South St. Anthony Park neighborhood has cross-hatching on it, even though there is residential space in here. Um, the, uh, the single diagonal lines, mm, up to the right in Falcon Heights, for instance, undeveloped. So that's the general classification that they had for these. And then they, they went into some specific detail about what all of this meant. So we'll zoom in on our areas. So there again, you can see um, the South Santa Anthony Park neighborhood, the neighborhood itself is industrial, according to this. And then here we're looking at, well, I guess we can get in one closer, D1, hazardous. Uh, that's the end of Commonwealth, the end of Hillside, Ludlow, um, Langford, on both sides. Adam, your house is in the hazardous zone. <laughs> Standish, Priscilla, that's hazardous. And then you can see that the rest of the area around Langford Park, where the school would be eventually built, um, Alden, which became Brewster, down here, um, this is all uh, rated as definitely declining. And then much of the north part of the neighborhood in still desirable. So. I've mentioned what the colors and the letters mean. The, um, the numbers provide a key to a description about each one of, in this case, the B zones. So here's what it says about B1. This substantial district is occupied by business, professional, and university professors and employees of the University of Minnesota. Prices here range from $3,500 to $8,000, and rents are from $35 to 50, it looks like. Some apartments and duplexes are in this area, which rent probably 5% to 10% lower than homes. Buildings in this district range from 5 to 40 years in age. 40 is bad. You'll hear more about 50-year-old oh, houses. That's, this is about 1940. Two-story frame construction predominates with some brick and stucco. Property values here have declined approximately 35%. And the recovery has been about 18%, 15%, sorry. The printing on the document is really dark, as you can maybe see. But still, an interesting thing to learn about. The owner occupancy varies from 75 to 80%. Its favorable features are its adjacency to the Agricultural College on the east and the University of Minnesota, Midway Industrial District, and the city of Minneapolis on the west. This is known as a high-type neighborhood 
for the intellectual class who derive their income from the University of Minnesota and the Agricultural College. So it's still desirable. C1. The area north of D1 is known as St. Anthony Park, south. The area north of B3, there were others that were called C1, part of the Hamlin District and so on. Salaried people and laborers live throughout the areas. The age range is from 25 to 50 years. The price range is from $2,500 to $5,500. Frame construction predominates. Considerable rehabilitation is necessary. 55% of the homes are owner-occupied. Rentals are from $15 to $35. Depreciation is 50% with a recovery of 10%. So that's during the Depression and then what uh, happened is the end of the Depression. The detrimental features of this district are that it is an old, deteriorating district and the desirable feature is its accessibility to industrial plants. So that's yellow, C1. D1. This district has reached the day of obsolescence and is one of the oldest districts in the St. Anthony Park section of St. Paul. Most of the buildings are 50 years old. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? And are in a sad state of repair and practically worthless, except those who are unable to better themselves by lifting, excuse me, no, that's what it says, practically worthless, except, except to those who are unable to better themselves by living elsewhere. Practically no market to set a value of price range. Railroad employees of the lower salaried class live here. People who have lost interest in life live here. That's <laughs> what it says. Let me know if you want a copy. Uh, the owner occupancy is about 20%. Frame shacks predominate, and the rentals are whatever may be obtained from $5 and up. Bleak, <laughs> very bleak. I, I'm not sure that anybody would have done a, you know, a particular study of the area were it not for um, these considerations about how bad things had become and how the government was going to try to get things going again. So one of the things that they did in the 1930s, looking ahead to the end of the Depression, was to start the FHA. And we know the FHA now, in part, because a lot of us have financing through the FHA. But the finance, the uh, FHA did all kinds of things to kind of make, the, make things work for uh, housing. So you can see uh, a booklet on the left, how to have the home you want. It isn't just about financing and money. Uh, over on the right, a bulletin, a technical bulletin, principles of planning small houses. So they did a number of studies, and they tried to figure out what's the optimum affordable size. And they figured maybe 800 square feet. And they came up with some plans for houses, what you needed. You could have a combination kitchen and eating area. You could have a zone that was more private, where the bathroom and the bedrooms would be, all on one floor. And then the living room and the kitchen dining area would be together. Uh, you might have expansion space in your attic. You might, um, you might expect to get a house, but not any landscaping. And you would do that yourself. So there were a number of things that they, they talked about, and it was partly house by house. Here's what a good house design is. But it also had a lot to do with um, neighborhood by neighborhood or community by community. And this is where the banks came in. Uh, they would often allow you to finance a house in a neighborhood that they thought fit the FHA guidelines. And one of the things that they were interested in was homogeneity. So it's like, you'll have a better neighborhood if you're all the same, which you know we now recognize is code for everybody's white. And it's one of the things that caused um, the, the um, segregation of cities, white flight. If people could get financing in Falcon Heights or not, they might stay in Rondo or they might move to Roseville or Falcon Heights. And so there were a number of things kind of wrapped up in this. But one of the things that I think many of us have still benefited from is that they made the process of getting a home possible and affordable. So in the 1920s and earlier, you would have to have a huge down payment, and the, the term of your mortgage would be really short. Like you'd have to pay it off in five years. 
And what happens with the FHA and then the VA is that, that there's a longer term, a 30-year term, for instance, and interest rates are low. In fact, for veterans, might as well change the slide, they were able to put zero down and you know, sort of live in the house for a while and get, get themselves going again at the same time that they might be going to school for free. So after the war, there's a, an expansion and continuation of these ideas about what can the government do to get uh, communities going again, to get people living in decent housing. And so the, the GI Bill of Rights, um, the idea that you could get an education that the government would pay for in return for your service, that you could have great terms on a mortgage, uh, this was all part of what goes on with the boom that starts uh, not just the boom in housing in the late 40s and into the 50s, but the baby boom, for instance, because uh, there was this, this uh, pent-up demand for um, adult relationships, for houses, for neighborhood and community that was caused in part by uh, soldiers being away for the war. It didn't all work out just as quickly as everyone wanted. So you can see here a protest about, um, you know, is this the dream house you promised us? Took a long time to kind of get things moving. They did get moving, and once things started to go, it happened fairly quickly. So for instance, here's just an excerpt of three of the suburban areas of the Twin Cities. Between 1950 and 60, the 1950s, Rose, Roseville grew by 273%. Same period, Golden Valley grew by 162, after a 1940s decade of 171%. Richfield, check it out, 363% growth between 1940 and 1950. And then again, pretty big in the 1950s. So the population between 1940, the census in 1940, 3,778 people. In 1960, Richfield's population was 45, 42,523 people. So uh, these programs did get going, and uh, there was a whole lot of housing that was built. Again, we don't see these numbers in St. Anthony Park because the neighborhood was essentially built up and there wasn't as much opportunity for that, uh, that rate of growth. Still, the demand was there. This is a page from, sort of random page from the want ads in the Minneapolis Star in 1948. Bethel College student, stud, and wife, want apartment, house, or duplex, no smoke or drink. A vet, notice that. That ad says, vet, a lot of them do. Airline sales manager wishes to rent or buy a two to three bedroom house, family of four, excellent references. These people are pretty close to begging. You student and employed wife need two or three room furnished or unfurnished uh, by July 15th. Um, Navy lieutenant and wife need furnished or unfurnished house. Uh, this this uh, gives you some indication about how much demand there was uh, for houses, and again, if. If there isn't a continual pace of renewal and rebuilding, for instance, in the 1930s and 19, first half of the 1940s, and then all of, all of a sudden millions of uh, vets come into the system, and they get married, and they start to have kids, and they don't just need a place to live, they need a two to three bedroom place to live. And they probably weren't being greedy or weird about it. They, you know, they were just sort of um, you know, kind of doing their best. Home sweet home. Where can we be alone? Employed couple, college grads need an apartment furnished or unfurnished. So again, a kind of desperation showing up here in these uh, requests for housing. Uh, sometimes institutions would step in when Luther Seminary builds Gullickson Hall. They have their eye on turning their existing building into largely residential space for their students. And there were a lot of students who flooded into the institution in the late 1940s. This is, anybody remember? Anybody know? Thatcher. Thatcher Hall uh -huh, on Commonwealth on the university campus. So if you cross Cleveland from the neighborhood and walk towards the fairgrounds, this is right out there, the fairgrounds, uh, you would walk past Thatcher Hall on the south side of Commonwealth. This was built in 1939, and it was made for um, sort of small apartments for married graduate students. And they had a big housing crunch, and so this was a way they could help to attract students, much the way that the University Grove was meant to attract faculty and administrators. The housing situation was so bad that in 1946, the university kicked out all the grad students and housed faculty here. And it was new faculty, and they had one year to live here and find someplace else to live. 
Not that they wouldn't have wanted to get out of their tiny little apartments in Thatcher Hall. Of course they would have, but uh, it was a kind of a dire situation. Dire indeed when we have a look at the Grove East, as it was called. All right, so I'll situate you here. Uh, Cleveland comes up here from the lower left-hand corner, or comes down, that's southbound. This is Larpenter. Here's the Gibbs Farm. Here's the driving range right there. A 1666 Kaufman sits right here. That's where the Bell Museum is. So this housing along Kaufman and all of this between Hoyt and either side of Falwell, these were um, Quonset huts, essentially. This was temporary family housing for university students. It ended in the early 1960s when the U decided they didn't want to be in this business anymore. Uh, they, they gave options for students to move elsewhere. They got a decorating allowance if they would sign a lease in a different building. And the idea is that they just weren't going to renew people's leases and they'd be happy to get them out even sooner than their lease might have ended so that they could use this space to expand the University Grove. So here's the older part of the Grove going off towards the west. And uh, it jumps Kaufman in, I think that's maybe Burton as a matter of fact. No, it's probably Kaufman. It's Kaufman because it goes straight through. Um, this all gets filled up with houses from the Grove starting in the 1960s, which is why I changed what was included in the presentation. So I mentioned that um, if I had my little control here, I'd go back to that slide that had no pictures on it, 1943. It's entirely possible that some of these buildings were built in 1943, but they would have been built elsewhere on army bases. And what happened after the war is that the army dismantled the bases, many of them, because they didn't have thousands and thousands of soldiers living there. They sold off these structures as surplus property, and then some of the same people who had been soldiers living in them on army bases <laughs> would end up living on the University of Minnesota campus in these same kinds of buildings again. I think that uh, St. Thomas had some. I know that Augsburg had quite a few. There were some along Riverside, right across from the uh, Fairview Hospital. There were some right in the middle of Augsburg's campus on its quad. And they used them as married student housing. Um, they used them as girls' dormitory space. Augsburg had a temporary gym that lasted from the late 1940s until they built a real gym, which is still there, 1961. And the temporary gym was surplus army property from Iowa. So they just took stuff apart and they brought it up. So again, I, you know, to be totally honest, we maybe do have some 1943 houses in St. Anthony Park, or did, maybe right here. It's all right, we'll go back. This is Murray right there. This is where the new building has been built, 1960. Um, a, a hockey rink, that's where their skating, skating band, their marching band skated, and that's where they practiced. Yep, that's what's sitting there. Uh, another more permanent way to address the housing crisis was to build places like Commonwealth Terrace, which was built in two phases in the late 1950s, 1957 and 1959. Okay, style. We're going to finish up with some of the styles that were popular at the time, which gets to be really fun because the styles kind of go off in different directions. Uh, we still have the fascination with the eclectic, the historical, the traditional styles. So we still get colonial revival houses being built in the 1940s and the 1950s. This one's on Carter. There's another colonial revival house just to the right. You can see the side of it. It's got a kind of a New England salt box back to it there. But the houses on either side, 1900s, 19 teens. So they were just dropped there in the middle of the space. This one is at Carter and Gordon. It's on that triangular block where Gordon splits and, or Gordon and Gordon Place split, and this one faces um, Carter. So we get, we get the elaborate door, we get the shutters, we get shingles sometimes on the fronts of the house. Those are all typical things we would have seen in 1930s, 1920s, examples of colonial revival. And much of the, the decorative language, uh, the shingles, the, the shutters, uh, those kinds of things were popular even in the 1890s and the 1900s. The, the houses don't look all alike. Uh, in fact, 
if we'll see it again. A number of those sort of suburban houses have this look. The duplex that I own over on Como, it's got shutters. It's got a little garrison, it's called, a little overhang. Well, we might as well go back and look, right? Why just talk about it when you can see it? It's coming here somewhere. All right, here we go. In fact, here you can see a little bit. This uh, slight overhang of the second floor over the first floor, you might see it here. It's, it's called a garrison feature. It was used in 17th century houses that were half timber houses, and it was kind of structurally helpful, and if people were throwing things out the windows, it was nice to have a little overhang. It's not necessary at all in these 1950s houses, but it was part of the look of the colonial buildings. So uh, here the garrison style is really emphasized with the, the different color and, in fact, different material. It's redwood siding on the lower section. Look at the sides of the buildings, by the way. It's like, oh, colonial revival when you look at the front and you go around the corner. It's eh, just sort of <laughs> not much to it. Okay. We'll get back where we were in just a moment. All right. Uh, here's another example from the Grove. Right next to it, we get a little Tudor action going on. So some of these historical styles that we saw last time continue. Family members, where are you? We've got residents, former residents of this house. This is at Keston and Valentine. It's a French Renaissance revival style. So the L shape, the bay window, that rounded um, entrance area with the cone-shaped roof on it, very much playing with the whole historical style and tradition. And right next to it, this is 1940, right next to it is a 1947 modernist style house. So they, they just get kind of mixed in, um, in, I think, what here it is, makes the neighborhood a really interesting kind of space. So there they are, and, and we don't much bat an eye at these. It doesn't strike us as weird. And in the 1950s, especially, as the mid-century modern styles were coming into play, especially in a place like the University Grove, where everything was architect-designed, site-specific. People wouldn't, wouldn't say, oh, I hate living next door to... I mean, they maybe did, but it wasn't a polite thing to do. <laughs> and, and the variety came to be part of, part of the character of, of the space. So there's, there's that whole look back at tradition, look back at history, quote the old buildings stuff going on. Then we also get... Um, increasingly an interest in the, the modernist styles. And they actually go back to the beginning of the 20th century, although I will remind you, everything was modern when it was built, <laughs> right? <laughs> Even those Greek and Roman temples from way back in the day. But the prairie style didn't pride itself on having a whole lot of historical quotations from any other style. In fact, Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to get rid of all of that and say, we're, we're on the prairie and we want to build according to where we are. And he did have some influences from Japan or certain sections of medieval houses, but it wasn't like quoting a, a Greek temple for your house on Knapp or Hillside or a medieval English building for your house on Chelmsford, right there. So this whole idea about ahistorical styles had been going on for quite a while. We get a number of them um, coming up in a, a sort of simplified form of the housing. This is a set of examples on Hillside, west of Gordon, where we have houses that follow what's sometimes called banker's modern style. So instead of having houses, sort of wildly exuberant, elite expressions of modernism like we have in the Grove and some other places, banker's modern was considered to be the type that would be the common form, the typical form, and I can emphasize that, very common, very typical, very popular. Um, if they're going to finance houses for veterans, they didn't want to go too far out on a limb. They wanted stuff that was really kind of solid and traditional looking. So these house types are called minimal traditional. Story and a half, usually the upper story was left unfinished so that the homeowners could finish it. As I mentioned, the landscape was usually unfinished as well. The houses had most of their living space on the first floor, and in some parts of the country these were built on slabs. Uh, here we had basements, and the utilities would be in the basement. But you can usually see the public side of the house from the private side. So you'd get a bigger window. The door would be a little bit off-center, because this was the living room. And then the door would come in, and then the bedrooms would be on that side. So bigger windows, and then smaller windows. So these houses, again, were built by the hundreds of thousands. And in places like Roseville or Coon Rapids, they were built by teams of workers who would specialize in just the basements or 
just the kitchens or whatever it happened to be. Um, lots and lots of examples. The other popular type was the ranch house. Claiming some influence from the Southwest, uh, popularized in some magazines in the early to mid 20th century, uh, these tended to be one-story houses with a full basement, which would often have the rec room. <laughs> Sometimes a fireplace upstairs and downstairs. Uh, the backs of the houses, in this case there's a porch, but the backs of the houses would usually have a patio and people would claim that you could have your own park in your own backyard. Big open spaces, shared backyards, you may know or have experienced this kind of thing. Again, large windows for the living room, smaller windows tell us where the bedroom zones are. This one's on Hillside also. This one's on Carter. It's a pretty typical, minimal, traditional house. One of their options was to have a front-facing gable, which was not very deep. It's not as though you get an extra room sticking out to the front. Uh, it was fairly narrow. And again, living room's to the right. The bedroom zone is to the left here. Right next to it, a ranch-style house. This is in an L shape. Sometimes the ranch around here gets called a rambler. Anybody know that term? Because they kind of ramble. All on one floor. And part of what makes them kind of ramble, at least from the outside, is that it made a lot of sense to have your house and then the garage attached. Because then you could bring everything right into the kitchen and all that sort of stuff. From the outside, pretty easy to read you know, what's going on on the inside of the house. This is a really interesting one. This is down on Buford between Keston and Brompton. And it was built in 1941 by an architect who lived and worked in the house, as a matter of fact, for a little while. His name was Herb Cromit. He built this as a demonstration house about how you could build a decent house with, without using a lot of extravagant materials. And evidently, it was a collaboration process with Anderson Windows, who were just in the process of kind of shifting their, their techniques, their assembly lines. They shifted them, actually, to do a lot of work for the army or for the military. So they, they, they used their machines to very quickly build things like ammunition boxes. And then when they were able to switch back to domestic production, they were all set to be cranking out these windows um, on the regular. So here's another view of it. Same architect designed this, and it became his house and his office. It's on Valentine at Eustis. Um, still a kind of you know, interesting building, combination, business, space, residence. Uh, some of the kind of traditional aspects over here on this residential side, but then some other things. And there is my new research assistant. <laughs> Not as helpful as she will become. I had to take a lot more pictures of the things I photographed this week because she's pulling on the leash and the camera is jiggling, but there she is. She's a shark. <clears throat> We're working on that. And if you want the evidence, you can come up and look at my hands because, wow, she's a shark. So um, scattered throughout the neighborhood, we get these, these modernist um, houses, houses that were frequently designed for their site, houses that have um, ideas about indoors and outdoors. Uh, for instance, we find with many of the houses in the Grove, which were all, they were required to be architect designed and they were site specific. This idea about windows gets to be really important. It's actually super important in houses like this one. These, these kind of small houses. The big windows, groups of windows, or picture windows in the living room help to make a small house seem bigger. You visually, psychologically, spatially could extend to the outdoors, and that whole idea about light and windows in the houses was something that was really, really important, kind of regardless of the level of housing that you were looking at. This is on Dudley, uh, replaced an older house that was on the site and uh, very much designed for its site and location. The houses in the Grove are not the only exuberant modernist houses, but are among uh, the best examples of those things. Um, we can see here, for instance, a Liesl Close house on Fulham, uh, taking modern life into consideration. Notice the garage that's included, although if you wanted to drive your big SUV or pickup truck, into your garage here in what's known as the Raup House, you'd have a little difficulty. But a flat roof, uh, often exuberant use of color, although for Lisa Close, not always. This is the house that she designed for herself. Um, she was the most prolific 
uh, architect represented in the Grove and has a number of other buildings, houses around the St. Anthony Park neighborhood, which we'll be seeing next time, because a lot of them were made in the 60s and following. Uh, her husband was an architect as well. He worked for the university and, and kind of supervised the projects at the Grove and other building projects, and so they were in some ways kind of collaborators on these things. Uh, bedrooms downstairs, living spaces upstairs. That's one of the kinds of things that happens with many of these modernist homes. They change the configuration of rooms. They'll open up, we now call it an open plan, rather than a little box for your living room and a box for your dining room. Uh, spaces will flow together and not necessarily the kinds of arrangements of spaces you would expect. Here's Elmer Anderson's house on Hoyt. This is in St. Paul, not in the Grove. Uh, just the corner of Hoyt and Grantham, 1950. Um, a really famous example, the flat roof is pretty typical, these bands of windows. One of the things that many of these houses will do is that they will forefront their materials in a way that the earlier houses didn't. The earlier houses might say, well, look at the shutters, or don't you like the dentals along the roof line, or how about the door? Don't you love the door and all the urns and stuff on it? And that all goes away here, and instead we often see a fascination with things like brick and eventually um, what's sometimes called cinder block and wood and glass, that those things become really fascinating. 1572 Northrop, uh, this is a 1951 house. This is another one that flips the traditional association of what's where. So bedrooms on the lower floor, um, living room, dining room, kitchen, all upstairs, sort of in the open space. Maybe the more pleasant of the spaces, so why not enjoy it? Right? Why sleep through, you know, half your, a third of your day in the lovely spaces and then spend all your time downstairs? So it was one of the many things that, uh, that architects would do. This is an example of a split level, level house on Falwell, um, multiple levels, and you can see that, that here it isn't just a matter of finding a flat landscape in Roseville and doing that, but, but working with the property, working with the site. The houses that are on the north side of Falwell not only have a chance, for instance, in this case, to engage with the hill that we see going uh, left-right in our photograph, east-west, but also the university golf course is right behind. And so uh, the houses rarely have a, a sort of a plain back door or backyard. They're frequently engaging with the space that's behind them. For instance, here at the, the Shepherd House from 1956, uh, Ralph Rapson House. It, like Rapson's, some of Rapson's designs, not only deals with the spaces inside the house, the box of the house in a different way, but makes the house into a bunch of different boxes. So the garage is a separate box, and then the living space over on the right, there's a courtyard that you walk through, unless you're downstairs, and then you can manage that inside. Here's the back of the house. This is what faces the golf course. So this idea that you you are in a very specific space, and your house is meant for that space, is quite typical of this. Notice the foundation is, is absolutely part of what you're supposed to see with the house, and that's, that's part of what the modernists would do, especially in these elite expressions with glass and with other materials. Well, we're going to end in what I've come to call the mini grove, which is down in that wetland, um, or former wetland, where a number of modernist houses have been built. And we'll look at just two of them. Uh, we've seen the Shane House before, and we'll end with that, another view of it right here. But up here, around the corner on Gordon, is a Carl Graffender house from 1954. Uh, Graffender did houses in the Grove. He was a really well-known local modernist architect. And uh, there's a, a really interesting collection of houses over about a 60-year range, 70-year range, in this little section near the intersection of Commonwealth and Gordon that, uh, as I mentioned, we will return to. So we're going to end with this modernist house uh, designed by Dick Shane, and it was the family house, a duplex, as you can see, um, in space that was made available, kind of carved out, um, that hadn't been available before. As St. Anthony Park continued to grow, just not quite as fast. Thanks very much. Any questions before we completely shut things down? <laughs>